sat where you guys are um, before. Um, I hope I can run this to time. I've seen some really, um, some really flat presentations uh, and I've seen some uh, some better presentations. I'm hoping this will be a little bit more um, interesting, a little bit more interactive. By the way, if you see a grammatical or spelling mistake in my in my presentation, I don't mind. I love having dyslexia. Um, and also I was in a little bit of a rush. I actually had a little chat with Emma about these slides a, a little bit earlier. I just wanted to sort of make sure that we, we were able to tell a good story. So I'm Howard, I'm, uh, I, I look after a company called Carbon Capture and um, we are all about trying to find uh, real world ways of finding ways to, to reverse our uh, climate change. In particular, we're focusing on carbon impact um, and I'm gonna start this off by telling you guys a little bit of a story. So um, I'm sure you've all seen the TED talk before. Uh, they start off with these really nice anecdotal stories and then they bear relevance a little bit later. So this is a story about opportunity. Um, so this is a story that was told to me by my mum and dad when I was a little bit younger about my mum. Now my mum was uh, a leader in, uh, in IT in the 1960s and 1970s um, and the reason why she was really good was she was able to take opportunities uh, and one of those opportunities came from a wrong number so back in the day when there were landlines people accident and they had to type in numbers rather than use the, use phones uh, the story goes that someone gave my mom a wrong number and she picked up the phone uh, and this guy on, uh, on the other end of the phone was telling a story about something that he needed and an opportunity that, that sort of presented. Uh, and the opportunity was, or the thing that he needed was um, a ridiculous supply of wooden coat hangers. And my mum was in IT. And she came off and, and, and the guy just wrote this, uh, just reeled this line of things that he wanted off. And uh, my mum just took some notes and said, yeah, I can do that. Uh, and then she set about finding ways of solving that problem. And then a bit later, she gave the guy a call back and said, hey, look, I just so you know, the number that you dialed before when you spoke to me, I know we got on really well on the phone, but that's, I wasn't the person that you needed to speak to. Um, but I've had a look at your problem and I think I can solve it within the budget that you wanted to. And the guy said, for your guile, I will give you the opportunity to do that. Uh, and that story grew, uh, was, 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 uh, but I'm part of within our lab, what we're calling engineering team approach or a team approach to supporting, uh, engineering. And so while Hello. I cover social Someone science and entrepreneurship, um, that is any. Thank you. Um, so that's all that. That sort of that story um, uh, uh, appeared as a as a great story for me as I was growing up, and the reason why that's important is because um, when I look at that story and the story of the climate tri crisis, I think there's a number of things that has appeared to us when we start to understand um, what's happened, and actually opportunity is all around us. So I think these are really striking points. So we've been hearing the story of climate change and the climate crisis for about 40 years. And the point of that and the reason and the thing that was observed is it hasn't got any better. So what, you know, nothing has changed at all. And it doesn't matter how many facts we get and how many pieces of information, the idea of being able to provide, how can I put it? Direct solutions, things that people, action that people can directly take is really limited. We're limited to trees. We can take a lot of indirect action. We can uh, we can not take flights. We can change our electricity supplier. We can drive electric cars and we can go vegan, but they're all indirect. And that feeling of not being able to do anything, even though there's an impending crisis right on the horizon um, is, is, an, is a fact that's not lost on me. What else isn't lost on me is the fact that in the last 15, 20 years, the power of the attention economy has grown massively and our ability to have behavioral change has been influenced a lot by that. And then there are other influences to behavioral change. 
So we've seen behavioural change in the climate crisis in small steps, in things like the plastic bag tax, um, where a small amount of, uh, of, of, of stick uh, really changes the way that people um, behave. And it's those things, those points there that really shapes our idea for carbon capture. Um, the other things that I've looked at is things that have worked. So there's been certain elements of social media led, uh, led leadership with really simple direct action that we've seen in the last 12 months. Everyone recognizes this guy, Marcus Rashford, and he delivered some really authentic leadership with a simple direct call to action. And so did this guy. Either end of the spectrum, so it can, it can come from anywhere, uh, either into the age spectrum rather, sorry. It can, so uh, the, the drive for things can come from anywhere. So this is what we thought would happen when we did our original, our original brainstorming, right? So we had the idea back in 2000 and, uh, 2019. Uh, in 2020, uh, when we really started to mobilize this, we thought it was gonna be a walk in the park. We understood what, what was going on, we thought. We thought, I don't know, we'll create a brand. Uh, and we'll get some people to, to like us. And then, then what we'll do is we'll go and raise some money, um, which will enable us to plant some farms. And then uh, that will turn that into, into to cattle feed. And then we'll save the world. And then we'll go down the pub. And the reality of it was that actually there's a lot of, lot of red tape that's involved in building kelp farms. Um, and this is something that we as a business have to understand and have to adapt to. We can have, we've had a fantastic amount of uh, uh, leverage in the press. We've done really well with our marketing. It's been, re it's been really useful to be able to gain insight. And some of the things that have happened to us, you know, apart from this, the, the area of red tape, if we take that aside, you know, People who've been working in sustainability, in, in uh, biology, in, um, in, in understanding uh, the imp fantastic scientists have suddenly said, look, I've been doing this work uh, in, in this area for 10, 15 years. And this is my PhD. This is some, so we've got something in the region of 200 years worth of, of, of real world study that's come to us in the last five years. So all this knowledge is really useful. But what isn't useful is that we're trying to forge out new markets or new ways of marketing products and services into uh, the world today. And actually, that's not an easy challenge when you're a startup. Um, the challenge is, how do you do that? Well, the first thing that we did was we created, um, I, I don't know whether I've gone off piece here. Hang on, just bear me a tick. Ah, this was our reality, actually, just before we came back to it. When we started things off, I think probably back in 2018, 2019, we had no idea what was going on. We just had a lot of confidence and a little bit of knowledge. And probably during the course of, well, probably during the course of, the last 12 months, we've, we didn't really have a valley of despair, but, we've, but we definitely had a slope of enlightenment. And certainly this is where we are towards right now because of the amount of speed to market that we've had. What we did do is we looked at seeing if people were able to or, or, or test out a hypothesis. The hypothesis that we had when we started off was that we believed people are prepared to put a higher value on nature. So we created these, um, uh, these digital bonds uh, called ocean carer bonds. And the idea was that we create our offshore kelp farms and um, the CO2 that they extract using the water, if we can find a way to process those in a low carbon way, which, which we have got, ability to do that and then we were able to sell it on in uh, a greenhouse gas negative way 
we can help people rebalance their carbon impact. So it's not a carbon credit. We were very clear on that. We're looking at a holistic opportunity that the CO2 wasn't in the water. It had been processed in a low carbon intensive way. We turned it into something useful, such as cattle feed or uh, fertilizer. And there was no petrochemical alternative or, or a lesser amount of petrol petrochemical alternative. So that was a, a quadruple bottom line. And the, I think the, one of the things that hit us with our reality was that we were going to be, we're going to be planting our kelp forests in, in Devon, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, in just off the coast of Wales. And um, everything would sort of work out. And the red tape thing that I referred to a little bit earlier, actually, that's the reality of having to put up licensing, having to get permissions and having to try things out. And what we've then been able to understand is actually how much kelp we can actually produce from those uh, eight hectares. Now we've really drilled down into it. And what we've learned is this. Our reality is that to supply solutions that are effective to our, to our world, we may have to pivot. And I mean that in, the sen in this sense. The amount of volume that we have coming from our original kelp farms, that isn't going to be enough to take us into the animal feed market, not to be able to be competitive. Further market research, is that the next one? Yeah. Further market analysis has told us that when we look into that animal feed market, that may be a little bit difficult to break into. So we have to look at other things and other solutions. What are we going to be able to do right now? Because our business is all about the most amount of impact we can make today and be pragmatic about it, practical solutions. OK, so we're going to end up with 600 tons of wet kelp by the time we launch our farms. OK, after we launch our farms. What can we make with that that, can, that people can connect with? Because the feedback that we got from our ocean care bonds was that, you know, and we, and we sold out of these, by the way, we had uh, something like a, a, a hundred of these and we've sold out. We tested out this hypothesis that people were prepared to put a higher value on nature. We created some adverts. We sold those adverts into, um, uh, to, into social media, targeted the people that we believed that it would buy them, and they did. Which means that, that, that the idea that people are prepared to put a higher value on nature, that's a real thing. Okay. Well, then what we thought we'd do is, okay, what buttons did we actually press? when we set this out, because we know the ones we think we did. So we went around and we sort of sought feedback from our buyers. And this is what we learned. We learned that people love our brand. That's amazing. And, and that's not a new piece of information that we the, to us in the sense of we designed it to be a loved brand. So, OK, well, we've achieved that certain amount. The other thing that we learn is that people do want to take direct action on climate change. And the ocean carrier bonds were a step in that right direction. But we need more alternatives to just planting trees. And the third thing that we learned that was really impressive uh, was that people really love the idea of regenerative natural solutions um, that let nature start to heal itself, find ways that we can give nature a chance to flourish. And I don't think any of those were really new to us, but it's really nice to know that we're not the only ones to think about that and to think that either. So what are we going to be doing? And the reason why I talked about the importance of Pivot, because at the beginning of this year, or just towards Christmas, the, the mechanism of being able to get our farms in the water, be able to compete with, in the cattle feed market seemed a reality. But when we gained the feedback and we added that to further market analysis, actually we have another reality. We're not in a position to compete in that global feed market just yet. We will be with a number of joint ventures uh, in, in the not too distant future. But right now, what can we do right now that has that impact? Well, um, this is one of my favorite quotes. 
don't wait for the right opportunity, go create it. And that's what we're going to be doing. So one of the things that we're looking at immediately is that we're going to be testing out a biostimulant um, uh, uh, biochar combination that is going to be sort of like a, a compost. And we're going to give people the chance to bury some of their own carbon footprint using the biochar. So we'll take the kelp out of the water, process it in a low carbon intensive way and use all the, all the energy and the nutrients that we take out from the kelp uh, to turn it into either a fertilizer, into natural gas, um, et cetera, uh, and turn it into this biochar and then turn the biochar into some sort of compost and then let people have the opportunity to test that out, to, to buy that. Once we've proved that along this long, along with our ocean care bonds, um, we will have a number of new things to be, uh, we'll have a couple of products on the market. And in addition to that, we'll also have some sponsorship and some additional revenue for sponsoring of our farms. So then we've got three products. We'll have three different markets that we've appealed to. We've appealed to the people who want to have a higher value of nature and want to rebalance their carbon impact. We'll have a lower entry market opportunity, which will have a tangible effect. And we'll have a corporate solution that will allow large businesses to interact with the problem and show that they are taking a lead in, uh, in, in trying to fight um, uh, 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 carbon pollution. So what's next? For us, we've got these three things that we need to try to, these four, four, four or five things that we need to try and achieve. In the next few weeks, um, we're going to be starting a crowdfunder campaign to uh, fund ourselves for a, couple of, for, for a couple of our farms and also to test out that biochar compost um, uh, solution. Um, I can tell you it's got a really cool name. I can't tell you about it just yet, though. Um, we're going to be testing out all three products, uh, that, that product onto the market. Um, we're going to be launching our portfolio of those three products. We hope to have uh, our farms in the water either in July or October. And there's a really good chance that we're going to be maybe speaking at COP26 as well. So all of those things lead to what we're having as our, as our strategy for, for, for 2021. And that's really to become the, uh, yeah, uh, the go-to brand um, for uh, uh, and a brand that people love that helps to fight our, our carbon impact. We're going to build up a load, of, uh, up a load of practical products and services that people can interact with and change the way that tipping points and uh, uh, the tipping point of the carbon crisis has been viewed by everyone, hopefully. There'll be opportunity for, um, uh, for private citizens, for businesses, uh, and for entrepreneurs to, 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 to take an interest in solving this, because that is how you develop engagement. And that is uh, my little chat today. Um, I'm happy to take some questions from you guys. Um, I hope you found that um, informative. Um, if there's further information that we can provide, et cetera, I'd be happy to have a chat. Awesome. Thank you, Howard. Um, I think that's a very, a very interesting story and process of um, incorporating the marine environment into, uh, into markets and the economy. So now we will open the floor for questions. Uh, you can either type them into the chat or there's also a raise hand function on, on Zoom. Um, so feel free to do that and you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Um, but yeah, and then we have another. This is always the most awkward. The first question is always the most awkward one, isn't it? You're like, <laughs> is it gonna happen? Or was it really that obvious? Uh, are there any additional questions? Yeah. Well, I think I, I have a quick question. Um, could you, I know we chatted about this when, when we met to, to set up this seminar, but could you maybe speak more to um, the, the, the idea you have of the creating the supply chain from the kelp farm 
like to the farmers and having this very like local slash sustainable um, supply chain, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's let's the, the 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 practicality of it is that everything that we have to do has to have a low carbon impact. So let's let's talk about where we're going to plant our, our farms first off. We're going to be in we're going to be in Wales in Carmarthen Bay um, that has. Um, two really different coastlines and actually four four or five counties around it that we can actually work with so we grow so the the understanding is that when we grow the kelp um, again we process it in a low carbon intensive way if we're working with um, other kelp farmers and there's loads of them in in, in the well in the around, around that sort of that bay and along south uh, in south wales um, what we can what we can actually do is if we can find ways to help them process their kelp in low carbon ways. So maybe using uh, low carbon processing such as the ones that we've developed um, or developing. Um, what we can do is give them an opportunity to earn money outside of the farming cycle. So interestingly, um, I find it a really I find it really difficult that if you are providing food for us either in agriculture or in um uh, uh in, in the farming industry your your cycle is so short it's eight or nine months and the rest of the time you've got to do something else especially in, in agriculture and marine mar uh, marine especially in the uk um so having money outside that farming cycle is pivotal now we believe that once we can gain the data from low carbon intensive ways of processing the aquaculture, um, uh, we can sell that as rebalanced carbon, and then we can give a, a royalty payment to the farmer. Now that's something that then has, that they have a badge of honor. So that can give a higher quality that this kelp has not only been grown, but it's been processed in a low carbon intensive way that they can then sell on. That's really cool. Um, the idea of the, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the biomass that we create. So let's just assume the biomass we create is going to go into a, a cattle feed or a fertilizer. The most important people that we can get that to are the ones in the local area. They're the ones that are going to benefit most because the nutrients are going to be rich within the kelp and the seaweed. It's going to be, be able, it's going to be able to uh, sort of nourish the uh, nourish the land and, and also to be able to contain more of the nutrients if we were going into the cattle feed to be able to make sure that the the the, the cattle have um, uh, uh, produce less methane gas. So when you uh, you put uh, a certain amount of kelp into cattle feed, it has a fantastic effect on their microbiome uh, and it helps them uh, helps them produce far less methane gas and the, the our understanding there is we need to create a certain type of, uh, uh, of uh, grow a certain type of kelp or seaweed with brome form in it um, uh, or, or a certain red type of seaweed um, and then we can use that to create that cattle feed now we've located places in great britain that we can grow that we can grow the right sort of stuff unfortunately the stuff that we're going to be growing in Wales isn't a natural, isn't 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 a native species uh, for that. So so we don't have sorry, isn't um, the stuff that we're growing in Wales isn't that kelp? It, uh, we'll be bringing in a non-native species, and I don't think that's something we want to test in our, our ecosystem on our first go. I think that probably would be a little bit of bad press, if I was honest. Um, so we want to have a look at that in, in, on practical terms. What can we do with that? And that idea of turning that into a fertilizer that or a soil improver that people can actually touch uh, and do something about is kind of it's really exciting everyone that we talk we talk to about that it's like that's a that's that's an innovation it's it's just a different way of, of, of using information that's already out there uh, and we really we really like that yeah great thank you um, so for those who just joined, we're kind of in the Q&A part of this presentation, so feel free to ask questions in the chat or you can raise your hand with that function on Zoom. So next we have a question from Saf and she asks, who is your target in terms of social media marketing? Um, normal people, influencers, does it actually have a measurable impact? Oh, great question, Saf. Um... Thank you. So, who do we target with so uh, uh, with social media? Okay, so different different products have different market types. 
So I, uh, so we've split our market into three or four different social media platforms because this is the information that our market analysis and our insights have given us. So broadly speaking, I sit and look after LinkedIn. So any post that you see on me or Carbon Capture, and actually we have quite a lot of fun sometimes on the on the social media stuff where we'll talk to each other. We have we have social media voyeurs, people who like and follow the banter of a conversation. It's the weirdest thing that I've ever seen. You literally get to see the same people liking the conversations in the post. They're not adding anything. They're just watching it. So that on LinkedIn is really fascinating to me. Um, and then you start to follow chains. And the reason why LinkedIn is really important is because all of our investors, potential investors, there's a load of aquaculture specialists in there, loads of people interested in sustainability and biology and ecology. And actually, it's a really good catch all for everyone. It builds up the brand quite easily. Um, and it's probably our most followed social media platform. Facebook is really where we've leveraged for ocean carer bonds. And it probably would be um, uh, for demographic purposes where we'd probably go for for the other, for the soil improvement. I wish I could tell you the name of it. I really do. It's so cool. OK, anyway, I can't. Um, so, uh, yeah, so probably be a similar sort of demographic. We had a lot of information that says that people from the, uh, so the, the feedback says, approximate age to people buying and clicks were between 35 and 55 uh, and most of the time which was really great we got the price point correct and in the sense of people were able to make a high value purchase and it was just at the right price point where they didn't go and do all the market research first it still felt like it was a gut reaction buy so we were massively delighted that the marketing works I, I was i was really thrilled by that um, so that that worked really well. Um, the 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 feedback that we got lots of times is uh, because we weren't we were testing it out. We were testing out what the actual market was. Um, so there's a lot of people in the lower age group that said that the the price point that we had of a hundred pound for an ocean carer bond was a little bit too high for them. They wanted something a little bit lower, and that's why we've increased. The, we've done this soil improver part because a lot of the demographic feedback said that they were environmental activists um, and also interested, interested in gardening nature and such like and you're thinking okay well if you're interested in those things there's a high chance that you're going to be interested in these products as well so uh, this product as well um, instagram really interesting when people came off our advert um, from the paid for advertising from Facebook, the first thing they checked was Instagram. We could see that from a heat map tra tracker um, and we need to up our game on Instagram. So we've started to dial that up. I won't confess to being a master at any of this social media stuff, um, but the ability to be able to create good content on those platforms, Instagram and uh, well, Instagram in particular has had an influence on the feedback that we've got and the amount of clicks. So we're also monitoring clicks from Instagram back onto Facebook. And as we've now increased the amount of volume of posts that we've had on Instagram, the amount of hits and direct links has come back onto the website, which is also really fascinating. Twitter. Oh, what a difficult platform that is to manage. Um, when you're trying to develop a space that isn't around, um, you've got to do a lot. You've got to do a lot of courting. Um, you've got to do a lot of polite following. You've got to follow me, follow you back, etc. Um, and and now finally, after about three or four months, we went from from non-existent. I think when we looked, yeah, I mean, it was it was non-existent when we launched. We've got around about 200, but by far the most uh, the most engagement comes from LinkedIn. And whether that's because I'm on that platform and I'm looking after it, and I do. You know, I have to sit there like a bit of a keyboard warrior. I don't know, um, but uh, at the same time, it's it, 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 it does it does what we need to do. So I think that sort of uh, that's our that's our strategy around those markets. Um, I'd love to be uh, things that I'd like to be able to do. I'd like to be able to develop a TikTok following. Um, I would like to be able to introduce a TikTok style following for education into aquaculture. I think there's a great opportunity around that. Um, I don't have resources for it, 
we do have a great brand name for we have a great brand name for it ready to go and we've got a marketing strategy around it when it's ready but we don't have capability to be able to deliver on that so there's a there's a uh, there's there's opportunity for that uh, for when we we've, we've developed resources or we've got resources in house or we can gain resources in house to be able to do that and that's definitely a huge market and the reason why that's a huge market is cuz honestly the people that we know that we that we need to influence they have kids and kids and everyone uses TikTok for those messages. If we can find a way of um, interacting at a more effective educational level in that platform, social media is the way to go. Does that answer your question, Seth? Yay. Cool. Happy customer number one. Dick. So Felix has the next question and he asked, have you ever looked at or have you looked into creating a market for higher value consumer products with kelp, such as nutritional supplements? Yes, we have. Um, so this is this is a great um, this is a great uh, market. I have a couple of challenges with that that I haven't we haven't worked out yet. So scientifically, the amount of work you or the amount or not scientifically. Um, carbon footprint wise the amount of work you have to do to get the nutrients out of the kelp in a way that is acceptable it's it's still really high it has a really high carbon impact um and until we can solve that i think that goes against most of our ethics and our ethics is that we have to have you know whatever we do has to have the smallest amount of impact uh, car, uh, carbon footprint for the biggest amount of impact um so as a good example we can develop we can develop kelp off Portugal, but if we've only got our processing in um, in Weymouth, for example, well, there's the transportation that's really difficult, and then you the time duration between when you harvest and transport, you lose a lot of the nutrients. So we'd have to look at how we would process more locally, and that also comes with a lot of bureaucracy and market and stuff. So that feels like that's a little bit further down the roadmap for us. Um, sorry, that feels like that's a little bit further down the roadmap right now for us. We have to focus in on the things that we know we can influence as early as possible because that builds up our brand uh, and that builds up our reputation. Um, get some quick, get some earlier wins in that can make people feel like they're part of the journey. Um, and then you'll have a chance to have some really, you know, have some really great influences that will back you more and more because it's all very well and good saying, hey, we can do something, but you have to build up trust and trust takes time. So this, this two year period, we're all about test and learn. We're, you know, we're going to give everything a go. We're going to go with that 80, 20 rule, right? Once we've got 80% of the, uh, the evidence, we're going forward. That's it. Felix, does that answer your question? I'll take that. Is it? Yes. I, yes, perfect. Yes, perfect. I like it. That's two from two. I'm on a roll. Okay, okay good. So Saf has um, another question is, do you plan on expanding the project to other corners of the world or is kelp more of a local type of flora? If it is, are there equivalents for places other than the UK? There's a really short answer for this. Yes, we are absolutely looking for global uh, global um, uh, solutions and global partners. Um, there's a couple of challenges with that. We have to be able to um, we have to be able to make it work. So when I say by making it work, okay. So first thing, we have um, we have got had an inquiry from Barbados. We are honestly the stuff that comes in at the moment is just this just crazy stuff. Uh, you you can't believe it. Uh, one day it's 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 this is this happened like last week. So we got had a conversation with Barbados. Right? They have um, sargasm. No nope, sargasm, uh, and that grows up on that grows on the uh, that grows from the the whole of the uh, that region. Um, uh, and when there's a storm, you literally get these huge um, uh, uh, tons and tons and tons of this uh, of this seaweed that appears on the shore. Um, and at the moment, because no one's going to Barbados, they said in some parts of the island, the sargasm is 10 foot deep. That's insane, right? And they can't do anything about it. 
Um, can we work with that government or can we work with even a kelp farm or anywhere around that? Yes. Is it, uh, do we have the funds and investments to be able to do that right now? No. Can we work in partnership? Yes. But that's going to take a little bit of time and we have to build that into a roadmap journey. The things that we're doing right now is to create noise in the UK, our home, home area. Um, and as we create that noise, we create a bigger echo chamber. And, we're, and what I've learned about our echo chambers, really important. So I'm going to come back to some, way, some, some stuff that has happened in the last two or three months, right? Um, so one of, the, one of the first things we identified when we started off was that if we're going to, we say that we're going to influence through social media, our social media and our, and our marketing and our content has got to be on point. Otherwise, no one's going to look at it. So I tested it out with a really interesting meme based on a film called The Meg, where you had this giant Megadon shark eating a shark, eating a swimmer, uh, eating something else, and then a boat on top. And I positioned it that one of the 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 the, the, the swimmer was uh, uh, was uh, was Brexit, the shark was COVID nineteen, and climate change was the megadon. It went it, it, something like seventeen thousand. It was a ridiculous amount of, of of likes and follows. And I'm like, okay, fine. How do I come up with content like that? Because I'm only going to get a brilliant, a good idea like that once every couple of once every couple of months, right? So we've been, so we found so we looked at marketing companies that were looking at sustainability, and we found this company. We found three or four companies. Three of them were in London, and one of them was up in Newcastle. And I looked at the companies in London. I thought, okay, I've got contacts and influence in London, but I have absolutely nothing up in Newcastle. Now, if they're a marketing company, they're going to shout about everything they do for us. So I'm going to use the company up there just to be able to create my echo chamber in a completely different part of the country than I am right now. And why was that important? Well, they, as they started to post out, I started to get connections from Newcastle, people making requests uh, of connections from me in Newcastle. And I thought, this is really interesting. And now I'm having a conversation with Northumberland County Council, the University of Sunderland, the University of Durham, um, a number of farmers up there about, is there opportunity to do that in other parts of the country? But I can only do that when we as, as we grow. If that request came from Holland right now, which is also a big in aquaculture, I would struggle for all of the, um, the challenges that are in the business market and for all the challenges that are happening with Brexit and trade, et cetera. So this thing suits us right now. Um, and there's a lot of ambiguity around Brexit, and you have to you have to be able to you have to be able to navigate between the between the bollards and the posts, uh, and you've got to find a roadmap that works for yourself. And at the moment, that's going to be working. And I know the moment I the moment I have a conversation with um, with with the the universities up in the northeast, I know that something will happen in another part of the country. So a university over in Wales where we want to do this, you know, will then say. Oh, why are you with them rather than us? So there will be there will be these opportunities, and there's a there's a time lag. There really is, it, and it's something like three or four months between the time lag when you say you're going to do something and when the action actually happens. From uh, uh, from a business that's starting up, especially when you, you I, I set ridiculously high standards and ambitious targets, right? So I'll say that we're going to do this at this period of time, um, and I'll work towards that. But realistically. There's me who works full time on this and the rest of my team, they work either part time or they're doing it in their time off. And, you know, some of it's going to slip. You try, you plan for it not to, but some of it does. So um, we have to be able to be a little bit agile with that. And that lag as well affects the customers that will come in and the way that we'll be able to go to the route to market. Thanks for that other great question, Seth. So next, Rosemary asks, how susceptible will the kelp be to pollution, as in the diesel spill that affected the Burry Inlet earlier this year? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes. Sorry, I can't. How susceptible will the kelp be to pollution, as in the diesel spill that affected the Burry Inlet earlier this year? I don't know where the Burry Inlet is. Um, so I, I can't answer that bit. I'm really sorry. Um, it's so, in Carmarthen Bay. Okay. 
that's my geography being really poor. Thank you. Um, um, I can tell you. I can tell you what I do. What I do know. Um, I know that the kelp will clean some of the water. Um, I don't think it's a great idea that it cleans uh, cleans diesel. I think that's that 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 could potentially damage our crop. What I want to be able to be doing is engaging with um, a, no a number of biology students and universities appropriately to help us measure that because one of the key indicators that we, or one of the, not one of the key indicators, sorry. Um, one of the principles that we have is that we always follow the information and science have us. The reason why we've gone with the animal feed is because we feel that the, the the science that we have and the knowledge that we have of our species doesn't fit what we're trying to do and we will have to pivot and move our products and services to suit what's in what ends up happening and though i could i anticipate in 2022 we'll have to we'll have to introduce a couple of different products and what those look like i have no idea um but the informational the the idea of uh, pollutants in our water we'll have to measure that really rapidly uh, and think about how we um uh, how uh, what we actually have to do with that as a as an end product i mean it, it it could be that it damages the entire crop there's a high likelihood of that i would i would guess but it is a guess uh, and we will we do have we'll have maintenance crew and a maintenance staff that we that, that will look be looking after our, our farms in the interim and and they will have to give us feedback and we will definitely need insurance. <laughs> great, thank you, Rosemary. Great so, question, by the way, thank you. That was a really great question. Thank next you. we have a question from Aiden and he asks, what are your hopes for COP26? Is it just a case of trying to spread your message? Um, that is also a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of hope for COP26. Uh, my hope is a lot of, for COP26. Um, when you're when you're a startup um, there are two things that work two things that really gauge your success that's timing and um, execution so i don't think i have to worry about the timing issue i think kelp seaweed it's having its moment in the sun no pun intended uh, but uh but um the execution of what we do is going to be down to how well we market ourselves. So the first question, the first part, are we hoping to get, uh, is COP26 going to be um, a stage to help us project? Yeah, no question. If, I, if we get the next four months right, there's absolutely no reason. Well, okay, well, put it the other way. If you're the UK government and there's a company that's a startup that started up 12 months ago when you're in the middle of the crisis and it's doing something to, to reverse climate change and it's succeeding and it's got reasonably high visibility because that's part of its strategy. There's only two things you do. You either ignore it or you follow it. And I'm following it. I'm going to put us put us front and centre. It's part of our strategy is to be slightly aggressive into the market because, again, that's another indicator. You know, there are other companies doing really brilliant things on climate crisis. There are, but we haven't heard of them. They're not. They're not in our. They're not in our. They're not in our minds. They're not in our, our eyes. And therefore, if they're not there, we're the ones with the power. The, the the people are the ones with the power. That's definite. It's just about focus and finding ways to help people engage directly. I'm all for any direct action on climate change, whatever it is, but it has to be really clear. I, I'm a big fan of Extinction Rebellion, but past the point of the protest, what's the direct action that we can take, that we can take? Does that answer your question? Yay. Three Thank in you, a row. Aiden. All Thank right. you, Aiden. Um, so we have another question from Seth. <laughs> Um, and then one from Grace to finish it out in these next uh, 10 minutes we have. So Saf asked, we recently had a speaker whose work focused on seagrass and we learned about its power in capturing carbon. Carbon. Is there any link uh, between kelp and seagrass since they seem to, since they seem to achieve the same goal? 
yeah, there is. Um, so it, it's, a, it's another derivative of seaweed, a uh, type, of, type of algae, etc. Um, it's um, we're looking for some of the for some of the locations that we that we that we'll be plotting for 2021 and 22. Um, one of the alternatives to just farming the kelp and the and the seaweed is to be having a, maybe a, a seagrass platform underneath where we can still capture some carbon. Uh, it's going to be a cost thing. It's probably not going to be in the roadmap straight away. Um, but the benefits of of any you know. Uh, and any flora, uh, water flora is is incredible, and it's just the same. You know, we we our, our ability to understand the absorption rate. You know, I'm probably preaching pre preaching to the choir here, but our ability to understand the absorption rate of of our oceans has greatly accelerated in the last last 15, 20 years. And and very very simply, the more flora we can get into our oceans, that starts to create carbon-based life, carbon-based plants, the better. Um, we have massively over-farmed in our waters. Um, what we haven't done is we haven't taken the nutrients out. So if we can find ways to create, um, uh, 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 yeah, where, 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 where kelp grows or, or, or sea flora grows, marine life flourishes. So we have a we have a, a very cool plan to um, I didn't mention it on this part of the the um, uh, this call but we have a plan to create these um, large offshore kelp farms which we're going to be creating um, super farms with um, and in effect um, they're going to be like they're going to be like little cities outside of the shoreline um, in the UK we have these things called garden cities and I like to refer to them. So garden cities were cities that were created, I think, in the 1960s. My, my, my history on this is, is terrible, but you'll understand the point of the story. A garden city, um, city just outside a major city to help people commute. Um, and when they first started off, you know, you had to be a little bit of a, an adventurer to try these garden cities. They're the likes of Peterborough, Stevenage, Welling Garden City, um, uh, Milton Keynes. Um, but now they're thriving metropolises. And the same thing happened, with, that's the same plan that we're gonna have with our kelp, offshore kelp farms, our, our super farms. There'll be thriving metropolises of, of marine life just off the coast, um, which will mean we'll have more, more fish, which will mean everyone benefits. Awesome. Thank you, Seth. And then we have one more question from Grace. And she asks, can there ever really be a corporate solution to climate change and ocean pollution? How are carbon capture seeking to ensure that the companies you work with or receiving investment from are committed to this cause and not just greenwashing? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really tough, right? Um, so let's split businesses. I split businesses up into two types, right? There's the ones that have to offset their footprint and then the ones that want to offset their footprint. Um, so the likes of BP, Shell, et cetera, all the, all the companies that manufacture, uh, have ma they have to, they, logistics companies, they have to reduce their carbon impact. Um, but then you will look at other companies that don't have to. Now, there may be outliers. So BrewDog are a great outlier in the manufacturing uh, side of things. But there are, are other companies. Um, so we have to look at service-based solutions. So HR consultancies, um, uh, accountancies, um, estate agents to a greater or lesser extent, mortgage brokers, um, computer games companies, virtual uh, digital software, um, such like. They have a much smaller, typically they have a much smaller carbon footprint. Um, and they will hang their hat on the fact that they're trying to do something else because typically companies in those, uh, those um, uh, typically some of those companies are a lot younger, a lot more innovative, and they care about the environment. The people who are in them care and they're generating money and they want to do some good. Targeting those companies and having a solution for those companies is really important. Um, so they have to feel like um, they have to feel like you, like you would feel like if you went into um, uh, a high-end shop and bought a really expensive bit of clothing, a suit, uh, uh, 
a really nice bag. I don't know, whatever it is that you, that, that you value, an iPhone or whatever, right? You have to have that intrinsic value that not you haven't just bought this thing. It has some worth to you. And we create, we're, what we're trying to do is add that value and that worth onto what we do with our sponsorship. How we do that ethically, right? So we're going we're gonna to look and target, uh, and look at the companies that we target. If a large multinational organization want to want to target us, we have to think about what the, the what what it is that they're trying to achieve and understand that. Um, we had a company that were interested in doing it. It was a, a, a small group of petrol stations that wanted around about the Nottingham type way, Independence, um, and they wanted to sponsor us. And two things struck me. Um, one, it was literally only about the numbers for them. Like, what is one of the things that came out to them was they, they, were, they were like, but we can get this many trees for it. And they didn't understand the value of nature. So those conversations are important. So some companies will, they rule themselves out by proxy in, in the first conversation. They want, to do, they want to do the right thing, but at the minimum cost. And we already know that minimum cost doesn't, uh, you know, doing the least, the race down to the bottom doesn't work doesn't the carbon credit system hasn't worked effectively for the vast majority of people so that they're not the companies we want to align to we want to find the companies that do want to do something so really interesting stuff is coming out with from um, fidelity the um, uh, the investment house and actually hsbc have started to come out and do some stuff um Elon Musk has created a little bit of a wave of change over in America. I've seen about another 20 companies that want to solve climate crisis. So going back to a previous question, timing and execution, timing. Great, thank you. That was that was a great question, Grace. Um, and I, I think a very, um, a very nice one to end on. So if anybody has any last minute questions, go ahead, type those in the chat. Otherwise, um, our president of Marine Society, Saf, she just added in the chat our Facebook page. So go ahead and um, check us out on there. And if you signed up uh, via Eventbrite for this talk today, um, we have your email. So we will um, be sending you any more updates for future talks. Um, next week is LSE's reading week. So we will we'll take a bit of a break next week, but the week after we will be hosting um, uh, another person in the marine industry. And we'll be talking a bit about marine energy and tidal energy. So super exciting. Um, yeah, and thank you so much, Howard, for joining us and giving some insight into your company and um, your future efforts with Carbon Capture. We, uh, we really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, and have a lovely rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.